These days, the West Side Highway is a five and a half mile long surface section of New York State Route 9A, running along the Hudson River to the southern tip of Manhattan in New York City. But believe it or not, there was a time when this road was an ornate double-decker highway. I'm referring to the West Side Elevated Highway. Built in the 1920s to cure New York City of its notorious Death Avenue, a street where freight trains crossed the road over 100 times, this once beautiful New York marvel would end up in neglect and ultimately collapse. So join me to find out why, as today we discover New York's lost West Side Elevated Highway. I'm your host Ryan Sokash and you're watching It's History. Let's start off at the turn of the century, when New York City was covered in dangerous street level rail lines. The New York Central Railroad was responsible for building and operating the lines that eventually became known as the West Side Line, which included a section of a road referred to as Death Avenue. For context, the New York Railroad was a major railroad company in the northeastern United States, and its tracks ran through various parts of the city. As we've covered in previous videos, the railroad's efforts to address the safety issues on Death Avenue eventually led to the construction of elevated tracks, what we now call the Highline Park. However, securing road traffic was the city's most eminent priority, as cars could be more easily redirected than trains, not to mention a better traffic flow would benefit the entire city. Hence, various proposals circulated in the 1920s to build an expressway on the west side, with some of the concepts being rather futuristic. The New York Central Railroad proposed building a road slash rail double-decked highway from 72nd Street to Canal Street, which would be constructed privately at no cost to the city. It would eliminate 106 grade crossings over 84 blocks. However, the idea was opposed because of fears of creating a rail monopoly. As mentioned previously, the rail lines would ultimately be elevated not far away along their own viaduct called the High Line. Then there was the 10-story train-slash-car-slash-office-people-mover idea. You see, engineer John Henkin proposed an exotic 10-story complex with the rail line underground and a road at street level, with the so-called people-mover built above that, topping 10 stories of apartments and offices. The highway would run on top of the 10-story buildings, which may have been a seriously unusual sight to behold. Apparently, the Manhattan Borough President Julius Miller had enough of the crazy ideas and said that something had to be done right away. He ultimately pushed through the plan for the West Side Elevated Highway, which was eventually to bear his name. As you might imagine, the proposal immediately ran into serious opposition. Many objected that it would be ugly. The City Club and New York City Mayor James J. Walker objected to the highway because it would block waterfront-bound freight traffic. At the same time, West Street News remarked that New York would see, quote, a daily avalanche of freight and passengers and traffic, and complained that the city would be, quote, walled by an unbroken line of bulkhead sheds and dock structures, blocking the view not only of the river, but even of the ships being serviced. The commerce carried out in those piers and slips was vital to the city's economic health. They believed that plans should wait until the surface railroad tracks were removed, at which point the elevated highway might not even be necessary. Even so, on February the 2nd, 1925, it was announced that the railroad would build a combined double-decker elevated highway and freight railroad for $24 million, at no cost to the city. The planned highway would no longer go to Battery, instead ending at Canal Street, meeting the Holland Tunnel, which would open to traffic on November the 13th, 1927. The northern terminus was set at 72nd Street and Riverside Drive. Ramps were planned at Canal Street, 23rd Street, Riverside Drive, and at least two other locations. The Port of New York Authority opposed the plan, preferring a more forward-looking comprehensive freight distribution concept. They attacked Miller as trying to push the project through without input from the Port Authority. So it's important to emphasize here that the Port Authority wanted a system of inland terminals and Beltline railroads. Accordingly, the Port Authority chairman of the time, Julian Gregory, was almost certain that the city would not go along with the Port Authority's plan. Miller responded by arguing that something had to be done right away. He said that if the Port Authority could put forward a comprehensive plan within five years, 
he would put his full support behind it. He also pointed out that this phase was only one part of his comprehensive plan for the relief of traffic congestion. He had already widened many avenues and removed several midtown elevated railroad spurs to accomplish this. He said the plan would not give the New York City Railroad any rights they did not already have. It was merely a relocation of the existing tracks. The tracks had been on the surface for 55 years, despite legal action taken against them, and Miller claimed they would be there for another 50 if nothing were to be done. Miller also received a letter from the New York City Railroad Vice President, Ira Place, stating that the railroad would reduce freight rates if the new elevated structures were built. In other words, they threatened the city's livelihood. Even so, Miller was right, and the elevated highway would soon be built. So on January the 20th, 1926, Borough President Miller sent a plan to the Board of Estimate for an $11 million elevated highway to be built entirely on city property. The elevated railroad was removed from the plan since the New York City Railroad had devised a separate project for partially elevating and depressing their existing railroads, now known as the High Line. Anyhow, according to Miller, there were questions over who would own and maintain the dual structure. There were also objections to its height of 40 feet and its placement at the east building line of the existing surface roads. The elevated highway was to connect to a planned parkway, now the Henry Hudson Parkway at 72nd Street, forming a route free from crossing traffic stretching from Canal to 129th. The elevated road was to be 60 feet wide, which was wide enough for six lanes of traffic. The existing surface road would carry local traffic beneath the highway. Ramps would be provided at Canal, Christopher Street, 14th Street, 23rd Street, 34th Street, 42nd Street, and 57th Street. Slow moving traffic would use the left lanes due to the left hand ramps. This contrasts with the current method of using left lanes for passing and putting ramps on the right side. It's kind of hard to imagine, but in the past, ramps were placed on whichever side of the road was more accessible. According to Miller, the highway would quote, carry buses that will make both its convenience and beauties available to the general public. He also suggested that the road be called the Hudson River Boulevard. Then, on April the 24th, 1925, Governor Al Smith signed a bill authorizing the construction of the highway. Funding for the $11 million highway were to be procured by property assessments along the route. This was considered reasonable due to the advantages gained from the highway by those living along the route. The highway would be built of steel with a cement face and a three foot sidewalk for pedestrians, although the highway was intended mainly for motor vehicles. Two block long ramps would provide easy grades for entering and exiting the highway, and trucks would be allowed. A fact that would turn out to be the literal downfall of the highway when it catastrophically collapsed decades later, but more on that in a moment. The Board of Estimate approved the highway, now costing $13.5 million, on June the 14th, 1926. This roadway was to be built so that a second deck could be added later for about $9 million if traffic warranted. Controller Charles W. Berry questioned the proposal until he realized that the money would come from tax assessments, so he agreed with the project. Then, on November the 10th, 1926, the Sinking Fund Commission voted to give the city title to the waterfront property along the proposed route. The highway plan was linked to a plan by the city for more piers for ocean steamships. Since the highway required land takings between 47th and 51st Street, it was easier to combine the projects and prevent additional expenses. So on February the 17th, 1927, the Board of Estimate adopted the final plans for the highway, setting a hearing date on March the 24th. It was split into two sections. Section 1 went from Canal Street to 59th Street. Section 2 was to carry the road over the New York City Railroad's 60th Street yard from 59th Street to 72nd Street. The Board of Estimate approved Section 2 on August the 16th, 1928. There were complications constantly. For example, Section 1 was postponed until September the 27th due to objections. On October the 18th, that same year, the Board of Estimate approved Section 1. 
By that point, the highway was advocated by most business interests, including the Downtown League, the Fifth Avenue Association, the West End Association, and 11 other organizations. They cited increasing traffic and the need for a bypass route to support the highway, which would cost little compared to its benefits. Miller spoke at a meeting of the Market and Business Men's Association of the Greenwich and Chelsea districts on October the 30th, 1928, detailing plans for the highway. It was announced nearly 100 meat dealers in the West Washington market, as well as the Gansevoort market, would be evicted to make way for the highway. Minor changes were also adapted to the plan on January the 10th, 1929, in response to several new objections. For example, the alignment in the Chelsea district was slightly modified to avoid proposed piers, and the path through the markets was realigned to pass over a corner of the property. In addition, the 14th Street ramps were moved to the areas between 19th and 23rd Street, so that they could spare many markets at 14th Street. In addition, the West Washington Market would no longer be demolished, and instead, the highway would just graze the roofs of some of the stores. All the same, in 1929, construction finally started, and the section between Canal Street and West 72nd Street was completed by 1937, with a southern extension to the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel completed in 1951. The west side of Manhattan was transformed, but not everyone was so happy. The highway was heavily criticized by Thomas Adams, Regional Plan Association Director, when at the meeting of the Municipal Art Society, he disapproved of the road's ugliness and noise, suggesting that they should have simply cleared obstructions to the existing road surface to speed up traffic. Adams supported a comprehensive regional plan for development in the Hudson Valley. The Fine Arts Federation also opposed the highway, saying that elevated structures were unsightly. But the most powerful voice, of course, was the famous Robert Moses. He proposed straightening the West Side Highway, widening both the highway and the Henry Hudson Parkway, and constructing the Lower Manhattan Expressway and Mid-Manhattan Expressways, connecting routes that would have stretched across Manhattan. All these projects were never built. Later in his 80s, he opposed the West Side Project, but by then, his power was gone, and his ideas weren't even taken seriously. The West Side Elevated Highway rapidly became an integral part of New York and was mostly uneventful for the decades of its existence. However, when the city neglected its maintenance, the term Death Avenue reappeared and in a major way. By the late 1960s, the West Side Elevated Highway was beginning to show its age. In fact, there were signs of wear and tear as early as the 1950s. The constant exposure to the weather elements including rain, snow, and temperature fluctuation, took a toll on the highway's concrete surfaces. Cracks, potholes, and areas of crumbling concrete began to appear, leading to an uneven and hazardous driving surface. The steel components used in the highway's construction were also susceptible to corrosion, due to exposure to moisture and road salts used for snow and ice control. Hence, rust and deterioration of steel support structures weakened the overall integrity of the roadway. To make matters worse, as the highway aged, it required more frequent and extensive maintenance to keep it operational. Repairs and maintenance activities became more frequent and costly, impacting both the budget and the time needed for upkeep. To be frank, the costs were simply beyond the city's capacity. To top it all off, by the 1960s, the West Side Elevated Highway faced increased traffic volumes, leading to congestion, longer commute times, and frustration for motorists. So in summary, the deterioration of the roadway combined with increasing traffic volumes raised serious safety concerns. Potholes, cracks, and uneven surfaces contributed to accidents, and the design of the highway itself didn't even meet modern standards. The road's limited capacity led to traffic bottlenecks and delays, all placing extreme pressure on this aging roadway. Something should have urgently been done. The city knew about these issues for years, and even so, these unchecked concerns all came together on December the 15th, 1973, with a catastrophic collapse. In fact, the highway was obsolete almost from the beginning. Its lanes were considered too narrow and could not correctly accommodate trucks. Sharp S exit ramps proved hazardous, as did left-hand exit and entrance lanes that made merging dangerous. 
So on December the 15th, 1973, the northbound lanes between Little West 12th Street and Gansevoort Street collapsed under the weight of a dump truck, which was carrying over 60,000 pounds of asphalt for ongoing highway repairs. A four-door sedan followed the truck through the hole, but fortunately, neither driver was seriously injured. The next day, both directions were indefinitely closed south of 18th Street. This closed off the oldest section between Canal Street and 18th Street and the newest sections south of Canal. Because ramps south of the collapse only permitted northbound entrances and southbound exits, the southernmost northbound exit was 23rd Street. In other words, Manhattan was gridlocked in traffic. From here, there was little left to do. The west side elevated highway needed to be demolished outright. As the highway faced structural concerns, maintenance challenges, and clashed with evolving urban planning priorities, the decision was made to remove the elevated structure altogether. This decision was aligned with a broader shift towards revitalizing urban areas, creating more pedestrian-friendly and community-oriented spaces. The demolition process involved extensive planning to ensure the safety of workers, motorists, pedestrians, and nearby buildings. Environmental considerations were also made, including the proper handling of materials and debris. Rather than removing the roadway in a single explosive event, the demolition of the highway was carried out in stages, with crews dismantling the structure piece by piece, starting from one end and working their way along the length of the road. Heavy machinery such as cranes, bulldozers, and cutting equipment were used to remove the elevated sections, and once the debris was finally removed, the nearby communities enjoyed a luxury that they had long been without. That's right, noise, traffic disruptions, and pollution were dramatically reduced thanks to the roadway's closure. The removal of the west side elevated highway paved the way for developing the Hudson River Park and other projects that transformed the waterfront into a vibrant public space, creating parks, pedestrian pathways, and recreational areas. This was only possible because in January of 1987, a commission unanimously agreed to build the highway as a six-lane urban boulevard with parkway-style medians and decorative lighting posts. There would also be 60 acres of a $100 million park on the highway's western periphery, a price tag later criticized by Governor Cuomo as being too expensive. In the meantime, the old abandoned highway was being used by squatters. The demolition of the West Side Highway marked a turning point in urban planning in New York City, emphasizing the importance of community-oriented design and the revitalization of underutilized spaces. It demonstrated the city's commitment to creating livable space and visually appealing environments for its residents. In more modern times, the West Side Highway is most recognizable for its role in the aftermath of 9-11. This was the location of that iconic flag-raising photograph and where much of the tower ended up falling. There was also debate over whether to rebuild the damaged section of the road as a surface street or a tunnel. As a master plan was developed for Ground Zero, officials called for the West Side Highway to be buried into a tunnel between the site and Battery Park at the mind-boggling expense of $1 billion. Goldman Sachs, which had planned to build its headquarters in Battery Park City, announced its intention to cancel those plans because of concern about the traffic patterns as well as long-term construction disruptions. As a result, it's been suggested that this decision prompted New York Governor George Pataki to cancel the tunnel project in favor of a boulevard. The boulevard was finished by 2014, but it took a lot of planning. For example, if we go back to 2004, the police forces had mentioned concerns that the proposed One World Trade Center would be too close to the West Side Highway, and thus perhaps once again vulnerable, resulting in a total redesign of the tower and the relocation of its site away from the highway. The last original elevated portion of the West Side Highway stands by the Riverside South apartment complex. Aside from that, the city was extremely effective in removing any trace that the roadway ever existed. All that's left are memories, and if you have any of your own about New York's lost elevated highway, please share them in the comments section below. 
and a special thanks to everyone who supports the channel by subscribing. Until next time, this is Ryan Sokesh, signing off.